Hey guys, Provo1701 here, and today is going to be classic Doctor Who versus modern Doctor Who. We're going to pit the two series against each other and see how they fare. Uh, we're going to be looking at several different things. We're going to be comparing the Doctors, the Companions, the special effects, the format of the show, the episodes, how it went and how they peaked. Several different things to look at. Uh, let's start with the Doctors. Um... Now, we had seven Doctors in the classic series. Again, the TV movie is an odd one. I'm not quite sure where to place it. I mean, usually I'd place it with classic, but I'm looking specifically at the classic series. So we're looking at the first seven Doctors there versus the modern series where we've had, depending on which Doctors you count, we've had, of course, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. Seven Doctors there in half the time. Um, not counting the Fugitive Doctor and the War Doctor also. <clears throat> of course, we've also had changes to the canon, but Classic Who did that too. I mean, Timeless Children might have been a huge retcon, but Deadly Assassin was also a huge retcon. Of course, Deadly Assassin was also a good story on its own, whereas Timeless Children also has a lot of other really dumb things going on. I've talked about that in several videos. You know, the Cybermen being made subservient to somebody else, them getting Day X Machina blown up. Not that Classic Who never did that, because it did. Whereas Deadly Assassin is a pretty good standalone story, it, but it does heavily retcon the lore. So both of them did retcons. So let's, let's just establish that now. Um, and of course, the quality of Doctors are going to vary across both, but I feel like, for the most part, the original Doctors are pretty solid. To one degree or another, they usually feel like the Doctor. Now, the first four are tops, like... The first Doctor, the second Doctor, the third Doctor, and the fourth Doctor, they're just tops. They're all good. Uh, they're all phenomenally good. Uh, the fifth Doctor and the sixth Doctor, I think, are fine. Uh, although I think, especially with Colin, he shines more in Big Finish. Uh, I really like him in Big Finish. But in his era, I still think he's fine. I mean, Twin Dilemma, Twin Dilemma is pretty bad, but that's just post-regeneration stuff, but it's still pretty bad. Uh, the fifth Doctor's a little bland. Uh, sometimes he picks a direction, sometimes he doesn't, uh, with Peter playing the role, he's fine, but he's a little bland, and Colin, again, can be a little over the top, but I like him in season 22, and season 23, I guess he's fine, I'm not a big fan of season 23, and then we have Sylvester McCoy, who I like the Seventh Doctor, especially season 25, 26, Seventh Doctor, but season 24, Seventh Doctor's fine, because... Most of season 24, he's still slowly becoming the Doctor we know. I mean, he people seem to think he's the time in the Ronnie Seventh Doctor throughout all of season 24, and he's really not. It's really just in time in the Ronnie. And maybe when he's slipping or sl sliding around in Dragonfire. For the most part, he mellows even in Paradise Towers. <clears throat> uh, now, Sylvester McCoy's acting abilities, I feel, are a little more limited than a lot of people to play the role. Like when he goes into his falsetto voice when he's yelling or when he tries to look like he's thinking and he's at times. I still love Sylvester McCoy, but I feel like his range is a little more limited than some actors. <coughs> but I still think people tend to have a fondness for Sylvester McCoy. I think on a lot of people's list, he'd either rank high or in the middle. I don't think he would rank low often for people who are fans of both shows, the classic and modern. The modern series is a little more... I feel subjective. I think most people would agree Eccleston's good. Tennant is an interesting one. Because, of course, there's a lot of people who love Tennant. You know, a lot of people will say he's the Tom Baker of the modern series. Uh, I was a big Tennant fan for a long time, even though I started with Classic Who. He was still my number two for a long time. I feel like he's almost the gateway drug doctor. He's the one that reels you in at first. But once you start to experience more of Doctor Who, especially if you go back and watch Classic Who, you start to see the flaws to his doctor and you start to realize how other doctors may be more appealing. And for, I think for a lot of people, the more doctor who they watch, the more tenant falls down their list to where he might sit somewhere in the middle or even toward the bottom in some places. I know my fellow Hootuber Paul Bailey is not a tenant fan at all. <laughs> uh, because he's a very human doctor uh, he is a bit narcissistic at times. He's a bit mopey at times. I mean, how many times do we get the, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. It's like a meme. Um, 
And whereas some of us prefer the Doctor to be more alien, like, say, the fourth Doctor, where he doesn't respond in something to something the way a human would, because he's not human. So the flaws of the Tenth Doctor, I feel like, become more apparent the more of Doctor Who you watch. Now, of course, still a lot of Tenet fans out there, a lot of people happy to see the Fourteenth Doctor come back. And I like the Fourteenth Doctor well enough. He's like a more mature version of the Tenth Doctor. I enjoy that. Uh, I actually prefer the Fourteenth Doctor over the Tenth Doctor. <clears throat> and then we have Matt Smith, who I really like Series 5 Matt Smith when he was really good at balancing the comedic Doctor with the serious Don't Screw With Me Doctor. I felt that was the perfect balance. Whereas sometimes, sometimes in Series 6 and 7, he skews more into caricature and being a little cartoonish at times. He still does the angry thing well, and he still does the old man and a young man's body thing well. They're just not quite as balanced as I was like, uh, and I feel like he's a little too goofy at times. Still a good doctor, still a popular doctor. Then you have Peter Capaldi, and he's a polarizing one. Um, I think people either really like Capaldi or they're really not fond of him, or I guess some people just fall in the middle. I tend to fall in the middle. The interesting thing about Peter Capaldi is he's almost like he's three different Doctors. You know, the first Doctor very much has an arc where he goes from kind of grumpy old man to kind-hearted grandfather figure. Some people say the same thing about Capaldi, that he has the same kind of arc where he's, you know, he peels away like layers of an, you know, an onion layer. He peels away like layers on an onion. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, I think a lot of people would argue that, you know, he starts off, am I a good man, this very gray area, doctor not knowing who he is, and by the end of it, he's found himself, and that's one of the reasons he doesn't want to regenerate, he finally finds himself, he doesn't want to change, but as uh, my fellow Hootuber, I believe, uh, I think it was DW Fan 91 has pointed out in some of his videos, a lot of the changes we see with the Eighth Doctor happen off screen between series, you know, Series 8, uh, Twelfth Doctor is one way. And then Series 9, Twelfth Doctor, he's different. And then at the end of Series 9, he's one way. And at the beginning of Series 10, he's different. Now, to be fair, there's always the fact there could be, there's gaps. There's periods of time between there where someone changes. Especially between Series 9 and 10. We know there's at least 50 years since he started watching Missy. So there is a gap there, and people do change over time. That's possible. Same thing with season 17 and 18 of Classic Who. I always get the impression there's a big amount of time that's passed between the end of Shada and the start of the Leisure Hive. It explains why the Fourth Doctor is more somber and why the Time Lords want Romana back because she's been gone a while and why the out his outfit is different. I get the sense that a lot of time has passed. I get that sense, not necessarily between Series 8 and Series 9, but between Series 9 and Series 10, I do get that sense that time has passed. And that could be why he acts a little different. But I do think it key to note that a lot of his personality shifts do happen off screen. Again, something I believe it was DWFan91 pointed out, and I definitely agree with uh, that assessment. <clears throat> so I feel like when people tell me, I'm a huge Capaldi fan, I'm sitting here like, which Capaldi? Series 8 Capaldi, Series 9 Capaldi, Series 10 Capaldi. Series 8 Capaldi is hit or miss with me. I don't really like the Am I a Good Man stuff. Series 10 Capaldi I really like. He actually reminds me a lot of John Pertwee, who is one of my favorite doctors. I really like Series 10 Capaldi. Plus, he's starting to get his doctorish hair, which I like. And Series 10 is also just a good series for the most part. It's, I mean, it's a mixed bag, but for the most part, it's good. Series 9 Capaldi feels like someone having a midlife crisis. And I think maybe that's part of the problem with Series 9. I'm not a big fan of Series 9. Heaven Sent is good. The Under the Lake two-parter is good. Uh, Sleep No More is decent. It actually has some good ideas that aren't executed perfectly, but they're decent. And how bent while I'm not a big fan of is not the dumpster fire some people make it out to be. It's a solid D or C tier for me. Perfectly watchable. Um... But overall, I'm not a big fan of that season. And part of it could be uh, how the 12th Doctor is portrayed for a lot of that uh, series. Now, I like what they do with him at the end of Face the Raven for the rest of it. At the end of Face the Raven in Evanson and in Hellbent, I like the character work he gets. That's pretty neat. Ooh, my back is itchy. But other than that, not a big fan. 
um, of Series 9. So the 12th Doctor, while I know he's some people's favorites, uh, he's very much a mixed bag, just like his era for me, even though Capaldi is one of the best people to ever play the character. And then there's Jodie Whittaker, who's probably objectively the worst Doctor we've had. And it's a shame because she is the first female Doctor. And I think that if you try to criticize her because of valid points, uh, people immediately just want to call you names. They want to call you sexist or whatever. Simply because she's a woman. You know, no one should ever be bulletproof because of their gender or race uh, from criticism. And I, the writing, of course, is not the best in this era. I mean, there's some good episodes in this era, but the writing is not the best. <clears throat> I feel like Whitaker is miscast. I feel like she's overshadowed by her companions. The crowded TARDIS really doesn't work in modern day, just the way TV is made now. And a lot of time her doctor feels on the back foot a lot and doesn't understand what's going on. She just doesn't command the room most of the time the way most doctors do. She does occasionally. She definitely has her moments where she shines. Uh, but for the most part, I just found her very lackluster. I enjoyed having Tennant back as 14. I still don't think I'd put him in S tier or anything, but it was good having him back. And then I'm curious to see what we're going to get with Shooty. So I feel like Classic Who consistently had better doctors, especially early on. I feel like opinions vary more on modern doctors. I feel like the opinions for each of them are more all over the place. Whereas for Classic Who, I feel like they're a little more solid for the most part. Uh, companions. Uh, both the modern series and the classic series have done things right and things wrong with the companions. Now, the classic series, I like the fact that we have companions from different places. Like, I feel the biggest problem Modern Who has with companions is that they're all from contemporary Earth. They're all from modern day Earth. Every single one. That feels a bit repetitive and a bit uninspired at this point. Whereas Classic Who had companions from the modern time, contemporary time when it was filmed. It had companions from the future. It had companions from the past. It had companions from other planets. I mean, you had past companions like uh, Katarina briefly and Vicky, for example, and Victoria. It had companions from, and of course, Jamie, uh, and I love Jamie. And it also had companions from the future with, like, say, Zoe, for example. And then you also had companions from other planets. You had a, you had Ramana, a time lady herself. And then you also had Adric. So, and then it had its share, of course, contemporary companions as well. And then with the fifth Doctor, you had some of all of that. You had... Tegan from Contemporary Earth, Adric, an alien from eSpace, and, of course, Nyssa, who is, of course, an alien from Trocken. So even from two different places, those aliens. I like that how Classic does that better, that not every companion is from modern-day Earth. Now, <clears throat> Modern Who oftentimes is better at flashing out their companions, whereas a lot of Classic companions are fleshed out and written well, there are still those that, for one reason or another, never got the character development they deserved. Like Nyssa, because the TARDIS is so crowded in the 80s, I feel like Nyssa never got the treatment she deserves. Tegan does a little more, but still not as much as I would have liked. Same with Adric. So I do feel the modern series, since they typically don't overload the TARDIS with companions, they're more fleshed out. Uh, they feel like people better. Now, Classic Who also does this well with people like Ian and Barbara. Not Susan so much. Susan feels cookie cutter too. Sarah Jane, for the most part, is fleshed out pretty well, but even she in stories, especially toward the end of her run, felt a little more generic in like Seeds of Doom and Hand of Fear and uh, Mask of the Mandragora. You felt like you could just slot any companion in there. Now, Elizabeth Slayton's still great. Sarah's still great. And the rapport between her and the Doctor is still phenomenal. But it still feels like 
Uh, she's not as fleshed out and as independently written as she was earlier in her run, especially with Pertwee. I tend to love some of the character development she gets with Pertwee in The Time Warrior, Invasion of the Dinosaurs, especially in Monster of Peladon. One of the best parts of the story is how well she's written. Uh, I feel like the modern series, the brief time she's in the modern series, writes her very well. And of course, the Sarah Jane Adventures writes her very well, uh, where she feels a little more fleshed out, which I like. Uh, I don't like... And, uh, the bit where we dive more into the Companions family in Modern Who is a double-edged sword. I think it's neat that we see more of their home life and more of their family, especially with Rose, because I like Jackie a lot and Mickey. Uh, that's pretty neat. It makes them feel more like a real character because we see their family. It can get overplayed, though. That can be overdone, where you kind of get tired of seeing the other person's family, and you just want to get on to Doctor Who, Doctor Whoing. So that's kind of a double-edged sword for me. Uh... Both of them have tropes with companions. Uh, Modern Who's trope is killing off companions just to let them come back in the Christmas special in some way. Uh, it, killing off a companion loses its novelty when you do it all the time or when they're separated tragically, like Rose is separated. Donna has to have her memory wiped, though we did get that sorted you know, 15 years later almost. <clears throat> um... Uh, Amy and Rory being tragically separated. Clara dying, but not quite. Uh, Bill dying, but not quite. I mean, even Amy and Rory dying, sort of. Uh, these kind of classic separated. One thing I at least like about the Whitaker era is that when Ryan and, and uh, Graham leave, it feels organic because Ryan's just tired and wants to spend time at home. And of course, Graham wants to spend time with his granddad. I actually like that. Dan too. I get why Dan won't stop. He almost died. Feels a little more again. Again, it feels a lot like when Tegan left because Tegan just, it wasn't fun anymore and she just couldn't handle it anymore. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I love Martha leaving because she has a crush on the doctor and she realizes he's never going to feel the same way and it's better for her to go. I love her departure. Where classic Who character deaths were rare. It's one of the reasons why Earthshock is held in such high esteem. Not the only reason Earthshock's great. Is because they killed off a companion with Adric's death. And since that happens so rarely in classic Who, it's an event. And the way it's shot, it's an impactful moment. Now, classic Who is not immune to, to bad companion departures. With classic Who, the problem is female companions falling in love and leaving. That happens a lot with Vicky falling in love, Leela falling in love, which is totally out of character for Leela, Joe falling in love, which feels very in character for Joe, to be fair. Uh, I'm trying to remember if there's, there's, I'm sure there's more I'm missing, I can't think of. But that happens a lot where, oh, I've got a new boyfriend, I want to stay. Uh, where I feel that's a little tropey. So neither of them are perfect about that. Although at least classic Doctor Who is more varied with his companion departures, especially with people just kind of getting tired and wanting to move on with other stuff. Ian and Barbara had been trying to find a way home ever since they left and just couldn't control the TARDIS back then. So when they had an opportunity, they took it. Uh, Susan, yes, yeah, Susan falls in love and leaves his granddaughter. Uh, Dodo's departure is just weird. Uh, Ben and Polly, you know, they'd been trying to get home anyway. I like th that. I kind of wish the modern series Tardis would go wonky for a little bit, and it's just a companion trying to get home. I think I'd like that. So each of them have their strengths and weaknesses on how they do their companions. I tend to prefer how Classic Who does them, simply because, again, I like that not every companion is modern-day Earth companion. I like having companions from the past, from the future, uh, from other planets. I like that variety, having a Time Lord companion. I like that. Now, next, we're going to talk about the format. Now, classic Doctor Who's format changed a little bit. For the most part, it was, of course, done in 25-minute episodes in stories that typically ran four to six episodes. Yes, some of them ran longer. Some of them ran up to 12 episodes. 
No, I won't say 14 because I don't consider Trial of the Time Lord one story. I consider it four stories. So as far as I'm concerned, the longest episode of Classic Doctor Who is 12 episodes. And of course, a lot of Pertwee's at the beginning were seven partners. Well, it's the three of his. But let's just say, to be simple, four to six episodes with some two partners in there as well. I tend to prefer this format, whereas the modern series tend to run in 45-minute episodes, accepting specials. Uh, and, of course, some of the 45-minute episodes turn up being, you know, there are two partners in there. But I feel like Classic Who gets it better. I feel like these stories have more room to breathe and more room for plot development, more room for character development, and less necessity of having to day ex machina your ending, having to wrap up your ending real quick, like Modern Who often has to do. Now, that's not to say that classic who never drags. I mean, sometimes it drags, partially just because, especially in the 60s, television was made differently. That's the reason why a crowded TARDIS works in the 60s, because everything is slower paced, and why it doesn't work even in the 80s, because even by the 80s, Doctor Who was moving at a faster pace, television was moving at a faster pace, and certainly why a crowded TARDIS doesn't work now in present day, because in a 45-minute format, you don't have time to flesh out the Doctor, a brand new Doctor at that, Three companions and guest characters and the plot. You just don't. Uh, I tend to prefer the longer format. Again, some stories would drag. The Daleks drags. I actually prefer the color version of the Daleks. I don't own it. Um, just money right now. I, I can't pick up the steelbook. If somebody wants to send the Daleks in color steelbook, I'd love to have it. I'm just not in a situation where I can do that right now. I've got the season 15 box set coming. I've got the Celestial Toy Maker uh, still book coming, but right now I'm just having to pick and choose what I get uh, because inflation sucks. You guys get it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but for me, the original Daleks drags. I much prefer the color version. Uh, the Web Planet at six parts is hard to get through. Uh, the Ambassadors of Death. It's a great four-parter stretched into seven episodes. There are definitely uh, some of those longer Doctor Who stories that there's padding in. And sometimes they don't drag. Sometimes there's just a little padding. You can see it's a little padding. It's not bad, but it's there. Doctor Who and the Silurians probably could have been an episode shorter. Uh, Invasion of Time probably could have been a little shorter. But I prefer that to a 45-minute episode that's going good, it's flowing good, and then they have to wrap it up real fast at the end. Uh, Can You Hear Me is a lot like that. I really like Can You Hear Me. I think it's a phenomenal episode. I think it's directed well. I think it's written well. I think it's cast well. And it's probably Whitaker's best moment at the role, in the role, when she's confronting them. That's probably her biggest shining moment to me. It's a great episode. It's still has that day ex machina ending where the sonic screwdriver has to hack the fingers. The sonic screwdriver that can't work on wood can hack the fingers of gods. There's a little willing suspension of disbelief there, whereas I feel if it had been, say, a four-parter in Classic Who, I think you could have done a little more with that, possibly. Uh, I think it would have worked better. Uh, also, the two-parters in Modern Who tend to fall into this trope of part one being better than part two. You take World Enough in Time, for example. Part one is better than part two of that. Uh, not always the case. I think uh, Human Nature, both parts are good. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Bad Wolf Parting of the Ways, I think part two is way better than part one. But there are, I feel like, a lot of stories where part two doesn't quite live up to part one. Although, thinking about it, several of them do, actually. The Under the Lake two-parter is both really good. Hmm. Whereas in Classic Who, your padding episode's usually somewhere in the middle. You'll usually have a good open, a good close, maybe some padding somewhere in the middle. But I find a lot of them, like Invasion of the Dinosaurs, fills out its runtime well. Inferno fills out its runtime well. A lot of those longer stories do fill out their runtime well. Dalek Invasion of Earth fills out its runtime well. Even the War Games never drags for me. There is a lot of you know, getting captured, escaping, getting captured, escaping, but they're going through the different time zones. <coughs> War Games really is like an onion. You're just peeling the layers away of what's going on before you, of course, have that amazing season nine cliffhanger 
and then the resolution of everything in, in episode 10. Excuse me, episode 9, Cliffhanger, with the resolution of episode 10. War Games never drags for me. It just, it just never does. Uh, even the two-parters for Classic Who, I think, sometimes work better. I still feel like the ending, typically, in the two-parters doesn't feel very Day Ex machina even though it's only 50 minutes. You know, a little longer than a traditional Modern Who episode. But some of the, I mean, the two-parters are hit or miss. Edge of Destruction doesn't do a lot for me, but I love the ending. Centauran Experiment is a great two-parter that knows it only needs to be a two-parter. I wish they'd shot it on film, though. Uh, Black Orchid is, mm, The Awakening's not very great. Now, The Awakening is a situation where part one is way better than part two. And then The King's Demons is quite possibly Peter Davison's most underrated story. I like The King's Demons a lot. Fills out its runtime well. And then the rescue is amazing. So I feel like the two-parters in Classic Who sometimes work better than the 45-minute format in Modern Who. Although sometimes it sticks to landing as well. But I prefer the format of Classic Doctor Who better, personally. Uh, let's talk about when Doctor Who peaked. I think most people <coughs> would agree that modern Doctor Who peaked early, that the first five series are really peak modern Doctor Who. Now, let's be honest, Series 2 is a bit of a mixed bag, but there's still some good episodes in Series 2. It definitely has some strong episodes. It just happens to have some really bad episodes with it. Uh, but for the most part, Series 1, Series 3, Series 4, Series 5 are probably the best modern Doctor Who has put out for the most part. And, of course, you have two very strong doctors for a lot of people with Eccleston and Tennant. Uh, I mean, the show did become a, very much a pop culture phenomenon, which carried over into Matt Smith's era, uh, which Series 5 is really good. I feel like Series 6 is where the series really starts to dip in quality strongly. It's a, it's a slippery slope there with a lot of... It's just a cluster. There's too much going on. I think Stephen Moffat had too much on his plate. I think some of those scripts needed a couple more passes. And there's so many plot points. Some of them get wrapped up. Some of them don't. Uh, series 7 is very much a mixed bag. I know a lot of people don't care for it. I tend to like a lot of Series 7B, but not all of it. Uh, and then the Doctor himself became more caricaturish. And then Series 8, 9, and 10, that whole era, are mixed bags. There are strong Capaldi episodes in there. There are bad Capaldi episodes in there. There are mediocre Capaldi episodes in there. And then there's what happens way too much where there's some really, really awesome moments for the 12th Doctor that are in bad episodes. The speech from the Zygon two-parter. Uh, Capaldi realizing why he got his face in the woman who lived, girl who died two-parter. Great moments in bad episodes. But then there are still standout episodes, but very much mixed bags. You Then we get to the Whitaker era, <clears throat> which has its fans and which very much does not have its fans. Series 11 divides people. Some people really like Series 11 because they think it harkens back to classic Doctor Who. And I can see where they're coming. I don't agree, but I can see where they're coming from because there are ideas in Series 11 that on paper I like. Uh, not bringing back any classic villains. I like that. Uh, season 13 of Classic Who did that, and it's arguably the best season the show has ever done. Uh, so I like that idea. Also, with Series 11 being more episodic and not having a seasonal arc, I like that as well. Again, hearkening back to most of classic Doctor Who. I prefer episodic television to serialized television a lot of times. So I enjoyed that. The problem is just that the episodes don't execute well. Now, there are some good episodes in Series 11. I like The Ghost Monument. I like Demons of the Punjab. It very much is a callback to First Doctor Historicals, which I like. And then I like Kerblam. But there are just a lot of them in there I don't get into. I have issues with Rosa, even though I think objectively it's pretty solid. It definitely has some problems, though. The Woman Who Fell to Earth definitely has its problems. Uh, the Subaru Conundrum is okay. I think it's from that. I think it's Series 11. Arachnids in the UK is absolute garbage. Worse than any classic Doctor Who story ever made. Um, the Battle of Whatever is not any good. Which is familiar doesn't do much for me. I like some of the performances, but it doesn't do much for me. And it takes you away. It's just nonsensical. 
uh, a, one or two little good points, but not really good. There's a lot of crap. Some of the worst Doctor Who episodes ever made are in this series, combined with a doctor that doesn't seem to know how to play the part uh, and isn't getting any good direction from anybody, I feel, and especially not from her producer. Series 12 is more consistently good. I don't like them destroying Gallifrey again. It also has a garbage series finale. And Praxius is just boring, which is worse than a lot of stuff, actually. It's just uninteresting. But there are some really solid stories in there, like Fugitive of the Jadoon, and, of course, the Tesla episode being standouts, and Spyfall being really good, although that's another situation of where, in Modern Who, Part 2 doesn't live up to Part 1. I find Spyfall Part 1 really good, and Part 2 just good. Uh, and then Flux is just a mediocre mess. I'll give them a couple points because they shot it in the middle of a pandemic, but it's such a mess. And then the 60th specials are fine. I have some issues with them. They're fine. I especially like Wild Blue Yonder, but they're not like top tier Doctor Who by any means. Uh, I feel like the show has never recovered from Series 5. Now, classic Doctor Who, you could say it peaked and then went downhill, but by peaked, I would have to say it's first 14 seasons. I think season one through 14 of Classic Who are held in such high esteem for the most part. And season 15 afterwards are held in lower esteem by a lot of people. Now, it picks back up at the end. And there's definitely some good stuff in there. I tend to like almost all of Classic Doctor Who. But I feel like the second half of Classic Doctor Who doesn't quite get the accolades the first half does. Now, there's a lot of us that know season 25 and season 26 are amazing. Classic Who really did finish on a good high, with 25 and 26 being really good. And I've also learned Season 22 is really good. And I know there's a lot of Who fans out there that agree with me. That season 22 is solid. And I think most people also really like at least one of the Davison seasons. I know it varies from person to person. Some people love 19 a lot. I've run into some people who like 20 a lot. Because 20, even though it might not have the highs of 20 or 19 or 21 with like earth shocker caves. Uh, season 20 is more consistently good. I don't think there's any crap stories necessarily in season 20. It's very consistently good, which I like about it. Probably my favorite Davison season. And then season, some people I know like season 21. It's got the darker edge. It's got resurrection. It's got caves. Frontios is good. Of course, it does have really bad stories bookending it. But there, usually most people have that one Davison season that they are really, really fierce about protecting, that they really have a love for. Uh, I feel like part of the problem with season 15, I think season 15 gets a lot of flack. I think there's just a lot of factors that were going against season 15. Season 15 had a lot of things stacked up against it. One, it's a transition period. Between, of course, Philip Inchcliffe and Graham Williams, and, of course, between Robert Holmes and Anthony Reed. And I think the stronger stories tend to be the ones where Robert Holmes is more involved. Horror of Fang Rock, uh, The Sunmakers, Image of the Fendal. Whereas the ones without him, although, to be honest, I know he did a lot of Invisible Enemy, too, although it doesn't really feel like a Robert Holmes, like, it doesn't feel like he was with Invisible Enemy, Underworld, and Invasion of Time, for a lot of people letting it down. I like Underworld myself. Uh, so you have this inconsistency in tone of the season, inconsistency in writing and, and the direction that the season is going. Uh, you also have inflation. Inflation really exploded during season 15. Like, just inflation really just ran rampant that year. Uh, and, of course, in the final two stories, Underworld and... The Invasion of Time, it's very obvious. The biggest problems both of those stories have are the lack of budget, the special effects. That is what kills it more than anything. I like the story for Underworld, and the model work is still good. Even Invasion in Time, I can enjoy the story. It's not the best, but it's fine, apart from the crappy companion departure. The lack of budget just hamstrings them so badly uh, mostly with the CSO for Underworld, for Episodes 2 and 3 especially. And then just Invasion of Time is just killed by the lack of budget. And that is just because they got hit so hard by inflation. And then the other thing that Season 15 has going against it is that Star Wars came out. Because between Season 14 and Season 15, 
if I'm remembering correctly. That's when Star Wars came out. S season 15 is the fo first season of Doctor Who post Star Wars. Star, I can't talk, Star Wars. And I feel like Star Wars really changed how people look at sci-fi. Um and what could be done and what special effects could look like. Because you look at what the original Star Wars looks like uh, compared to everything else that was out at the time. And it's just revolutionary. And then you go from watching Star Wars with everything going on in that movie, which for you know became the highest grossing movie of all time for 20 years. And then you go watch season 15 of Classic Doctor Who where you have it changing tonally. You have the budget running out, which makes it look even worse. I mean... Even if you had compared it to the Hinchcliffe era budget-wise, it would have been like, wow, from Star Wars to this, mm. But when you, especially when you factor in the inflation and the budget running out by those last two parts. Star Wars, the invasion of time, it had all of that going against it. And I feel like that's probably when Doctor Who became less mainstream and more niche. I remember Gary Russell talking about that. It was season 15 where it became... I think you were more the oddball out if you did watch classic Doctor Who. Um, and I feel like Doctor it never fully recovered from that. Uh, I still think 16, 17, 18 are good. I like 19, 20. I still like a lot of those. I know a lot of you still like a lot of those. But I feel like this, the latter half of classic Doctor Who never fully captured the magic of those first 14 seasons. But I do feel they are st more consistently good. I pretty much feel like every series after Series 5 in Modern Who is a mixed bag, except for Series 12, which is pretty consistently good, except for that crappy finale. Whereas I feel like modern uh, classic Doctor Who after Series 14 still had those strong, solid seasons, even if they went for different things. Like, I love Season 17. Season 18 is its own thing. Uh, the Davison era is different. It gets darker toward the end. Season 22 is really strong. Season 25, 26 is really strong. So I feel like it's more consistently good per season than modern Doctor Who after modern Doctor Who peaked in its first five seasons. Uh, the episodes vary. The episode quality varies Uh there are bad modern Doctor Who episodes. There are good modern Doctor Who episodes. There are bad classic Doctor Who episodes. There are good uh, classic Doctor Who episodes. Now, modern Who and classic Who both have phenomenal episodes. S-tier episodes. Goat-tier episodes. There are episodes of modern Who that stand pretty toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the best of classic Doctor Who. They both have phenomenal pieces of television. The difference for me is that modern Doctor Who has episodes that are just dumpster fire garbage that I will never, ever, ever probably rewatch again. Whereas classic Doctor Who, while having really bad episodes, I feel like never has an episode that quite gets to that bottom garbage tier that modern Who can. I mentioned when I was ranking, in part one, when I was ranking uh, all of modern Doctor Who, my part one, those bottom 40 stories, we were about 20 to 30 entries into the list, and I commented that we still hadn't reached a point where if I was ranking all of Doctor Who, we would have reached a classic Who story yet. And I was somewhere between 20 and 30 entries in at that point, and we still hadn't hit the worst of where classic Doctor Who would be. Because... While classic Doctor Who has some bad stories and some hard-to-watch stories, there are still usually things in them that are redeemable. Uh, the Chase, I think, is bad, but I think Episodes 1 and 6 are really good. The Web Planet is bad, but it still has some good things going for it, and I'll always respect the ambition behind it. Power of Kroll is bad, but it still does a few things I like. Tom gets a few good lines in there I like. A Delta and the Bannerman is bad, but it's still borderline watchable. The Leisure Hive to me is bad, but it's still watchable. I enjoy it well enough. I can still get through it. Um, Greatest Show in the Galaxy, the first two episodes are really bad. Luckily, the fourth episode is phenomenally good and saves it. But none of them reach the dumpster fires that modern Who can with stuff like Kill the Moon, 
oxygen in the forest of the night, uh, the battle of whatever, the timeless children fear her. Just those pure garbage, very little, if anything, redeeming about them episodes that I would never want to sit through again. There's nothing in Classic Who that quite reaches that for me. Even though, again, there's some bad stuff in classic Doctor Who, it never gets that bad. That's the difference between them to me. Both of them, of course, you know, they fluctuate. And just like both of them also have good middling episodes, good filler episodes. You know, I like The Rescue. Is it anything to write home about? Maybe not for some people, but I like it. I love The Romans. It's a great comedy. But then modern Doctor Who also has fun episodes like The Unicorn and the Wasp and The Crimson Horror. Good filler episodes that I still enjoy. So while I think both classic and modern Doctor Who have, you know, they fluctuate between good episodes, bad episodes, and episodes that fall in the middle. And I feel both of them have phenomenal episodes. Some of the best Doctor Who episodes ever made come from both. I feel like Classic Who wins because while it has bad episodes, it never quite has those dumpster fire, the writer needs to be slapped episodes. Like whoever wrote Kill the Moon, I never want to meet that person face to face. I mean, I wouldn't actually slap them. I'm not that kind of person. But I would very much be like, oh, you're the guy who wrote Kill the Moon? Yes, I am. I, I have to leave now because I wouldn't want to talk to them. Whereas even the, even, you know, uh, even though the power of Kroll is bad, I would very much love to have met Robert Holmes because Robert Holmes is amazing. <laughs> and next we're going to talk about special effects. Now, of course, people are going to immediately go, well, Modern Who definitely has the better special effects. Although, if you think about it, the early seasons of Modern Who, or the early series of Modern Who, which are considered the good ones, some of the effects look pretty dated. You look at something like uh, End of the World, for example, or even Utopia in places, or Lazarus Experiments, definitely a go-to, where the effects do look a little dated now because, you know, it's from the mid to late 2000s. Uh, whereas for me personally... I find it easier to deal with dated practical effects than I do dated CGI effects. Something about old CGI can be off-putting. It's not always the case. I think the CGI stuff from Battleon 5 still looks great and fits with that show well. But there are times like Mortal Kombat Annihilation or Time Cop where you're like, ooh. And some of modern Who while looking dated, can pull you out of the story a bit. still looks good. I still love The Lazarus Experiment. Very underrated episode. I still like End of the World. But it can pull me out of the story with it looking a bit older. Whereas most of the time in classic Doctor Who, partially just because that's the nature of classic Doctor Who, it was always done on a budget, <laughs> the effects aren't that big a deal to me. Now, sometimes it can be hard going. Part of Web Planet, <clears throat> uh, The Invasion of Time, there are definitely moments where the lack of budget and the bad effects, <clears throat> even I struggle to get over Power of Crawl. But for the most part, I just roll with it because that's just classic Doctor Who. It was done on a budget. And it's interesting to see how a lot of the people involved with pulling the story together use their budget smartly to make it work. Um there are a lot of them that stand up really well. Pyramids of Mars, the Ark in Space, Talons of Wing Chiang, using their budget smartly to still craft a good story. Plus the fact you tend to have a good script a lot really goes a long way. Uh, now, of course, classic Doctor Who has also gotten updated effects. And usually uh, I prefer the optional updated effects with a classic Who story that has them. Not always. There's a couple times I don't like Planet of the Daleks. I prefer the original effects. But bar one or two stories, if there's an option for updated effects, I want the updated effects. And sometimes after having seen it with the updated effects, it's hard to go back to the original effects. It would be really hard to watch The Invisible Enemy, uh, Arc of Infinity, or Time Lash with the original effects. It just would. They're so much better with the updated effects. Invisible Enemy is kind of, mm, anyway, but the updated effects help it. Arc of Infinity is greatly helped by its updated effects. Time Lash is greatly helped by its updated effects. So when there are 
options for updated effects. I tend to prefer them. Uh, Day of the Daleks has helped. Although, to be fair, I still love the original version of Day of the Daleks. I still think it stands up well, partially just because it's such a good story. I like the original version. I like the omnibus. Of course, my favorite is the special edition. So, if there's an option for updated effects, I tend to like them. But the practical effects, for the most part, are fine. Because, again, maybe it's just because I've been watching Doctor Who. And I think for a lot of us, especially who grew up with classic Doctor Who, that done on a budget, on the fly, cheap look is part of what makes Doctor Who Doctor Who. Uh, and I think that might be a problem some people have with the Whitaker era. Because the Whitaker era, if you go by a cinematic standpoint, is probably the best looking the show has ever been. It has a much more cinematic flair to it than even the Moffat era did with Matt Smith and Peter Capaldi. The, it's like a different type of camera, a different type of look, a different direction. It has a very in-a-cinema feel to it. And while that can be good because it looks great, despite uh, the problems with the era, it looks great. I think there is an argument to be made by some people that it doesn't feel like Doctor Who because of that that somehow it feels like something's missing because we equate Doctor Who with how this should look. And I think that's one of the reasons why early modern Who gets by, especially now, is because it does look a little dated. It does look like it doesn't have, you know, Game of Thrones money. Uh, and that even bleeds over into <clears throat> uh, the Matt Smith and Peter Capaldi era, even though there's obviously a huge budget increase between the Russell T. Davis one era and the Moffat era, you can tell and they look good, it still looks like a show that never quite had Game of Thrones money. Whereas in the Whitaker era, it looks so much more polished that I can see the arguments being made that it doesn't feel like Doctor Who. Um, so the fact it looks better doesn't mean you can connect with it as well. For instance, I don't think Doctor Who needs a huge Disney money budget because like a lot of big blockbusters, like a lot of the stuff Marvel's putting out now with their, with the MCU, sometimes too much money is a bad thing. It's like people just spend it frivolously. They don't try that hard. They're like, well, I've got a $200 million budget. I can do whatever I want with this movie. Whereas if you put somebody on a strict budget, it makes them think how to make it work. You look at the original Terminator, for example, which was done on a small budget. And think of all the other famous movies that have become famous movies that were done really on a tiny budget. I think Alien was like that, Jaws probably, uh, and all the other issues they had with Jaws. It makes a director have to think on the fly. They can't be lazy with it. They have to figure out, okay, I need to do this. How do I do this with this much money? And that's what I like about Doctor Who especially in the classic series and even sometimes in the modern series is how do I tell this story with this much money? And I feel like it may, it makes everyone have to work that much harder. It makes the script writer like, I have to make this story work. The director's like, I have to make this work. The people building the sets and the costumes, I have to use the limited resources I have in the best way possible. What is the best way I can spend this money? Whereas if you just have a lot of money to deal with, you can just... Eh. So I feel like a strained budget can help creatively. I feel like Classic Who usually pulled that off. Not always, but usually pulled that off pretty well. Like, I love the fact they used the same set in Arkham Space and Revenge of the Cybermen and had both stories take place on Nerva Beacon at different points in time. That's clever. I like that. And they even had a little bit of budget left over to give us that wonderful location shoot down in the caves for Revenge of the Cybermen. Uh, possibly as a consequence of that. Whereas sometimes uh, modern Who, especially the Whitaker era, comes across as a little bland. Some of the camera shots are very nice. I know, uh, one again, one of my fellow Hootubers, uh, DW Fan 91 has did a video recently where he, talked, he was talking about the cinematic look of the Whitaker era. Um, and one of the things I would contest on that is that as I said, sometimes I could see the argument being made that it looking that good. And he points out there's a lot of good camera work in The Woman That Fell to Earth. And there is. The modern, uh, the Whitaker era has a lot of really good camera shots. It's a beautiful looking uh, era. 
But I argue that you could argue it doesn't feel like Doctor Who because of that. I can see people saying that. I don't feel like I'm watching Doctor Who anymore. Uh, just because you're used to Doctor Who having that kind of cheap, wobbly set, even though they usually didn't look. Uh, that's part of the essence of the show, some people might argue. So I prefer the limited budget of the classic series. I would all, I'll always take dated practical effects over dated CGI for the most part. Uh, Babylon 5 is an exception to that because I still feel like even though it looks like it was done in the 90s, it's aged really well in my opinion. But And I still love the Lazarus Experiment and, and the world and stuff like that. But for some reason, I like the budget feel of Classic Who. Although I'll still take the updated effects when I can get them. So that's my thoughts. I feel like Classic Who wins most of these categories for me. Again, this is subjective. I'm not making an objective argument. All of this is completely subjective. I feel like Classic Who wins the Doctors. I feel like Classic Who only barely wins the Companions. Uh, the format, Classic Who. Episodes, Classic Who, simply because I don't feel like it reaches the lows that Modern Who does. Uh, where the show peaked, I feel like Modern Who wins because I feel like it had it, it ran longer with peak seasons. And um, with special effects, I feel like Classic Who wins because I feel like they tried harder. I feel like it feels more like what Doctor Who is, if that makes sense. I Again, I just prefer watching the effects from the classic series than the modern series. I just enjoy Classic Who more. It's more of a comfort food. Now, some modern Who stories are, especially some of the early ones, I love to go back to sometimes, but there's just something comforting about going back to classic Doctor Who and putting it on. There's just It just has a feel to it that makes me happy. So for me, with classic Who versus modern Doctor Who, classic Doctor Who wins. They both have their highs. They both have their lows. They both have their stories that fall in the middle. But for me, between the two, I tend to prefer classic Doctors. My three favorite Doctors are classic Doctors, four, two, and three. Uh, my favorite companions are a mix of both, but my top companions would probably be Sarah, Leela, and Jamie, classic companions. Although Donna's high on the list too. I love Donna. I love Martha. Um, <clears throat> they both have episodes that I love. They both have episodes I dislike, and they both have episodes that are fun filler. I tend to enjoy the format of classic more because, again, I like that stories get fleshed out more, and only occasionally do they drag. Some some do, but not a lot. Uh, even Colony in Space never drags for me. I think it's paced well at six parts. The Daemons. Imagine if the Daemons had been 45 minutes. One 45-minute Modern Who episode. It wouldn't have worked, would it? No. It needed that breathing room of five episodes. Even at four episodes, it might have been a stretch. It fits its five episodes well. With And you guys know I criticize the Daemons at times, but it fits its five episodes well. Uh, I just like when a story has room to breathe, when the characters have room to breathe. That works better for me. So that's my thoughts on classic Doctor Who versus modern Doctor Who. I want to know what you think and what you would have to say about it and which one you prefer between the two. So comment down below and let me know. Don't forget to click the like button as well and the subscribe button and the bell for notifications so you never miss out on another video. I also have a link to my Patreon down there if you've enjoyed this video and would like to support this video and also help steer the way the channel goes. You get early access to videos. You get to vote on reviews I'll do. I have to review Delta and the Bannerman soon. Bobby's going to love that. He's going to love it. Um, and then uh, exclusive videos sometimes as well. So if that's something that interests you, check that out. Link's down in the description below. Links to my Amazon wish list are down there as well in case anyone wants to send uh, anything off of that. Uh, my P.O. box is down there in case anybody wants to send me that, uh, the Dallas and Color Steelbook. I'd love to get that. Uh, the P.O. box is down there for that. And YouTube memberships are also available now. Uh, I want to give a shout out to some of my top tier patrons, Stephen Crane, Colin Coney, and Finn Perkins. I appreciate their support. As I do the support of all of my patrons, it does make a difference. I have several who've been with me a, a while, uh, Unknown289, for example, um, JLB Who, uh, Trevor Hicks, and I feel like I'm forgetting one or two people off the Simon, yeah, Simon Mincher, who has also sent things to the channel as well. And JLB Who actually sent me my Shada Steelbook, which I appreciate. I appreciate all of my patrons, past, present. 
Uh, I hope Ham's doing all right. I haven't talked to Ham in a minute. Old David, I hope he's doing okay. And uh, most importantly, thank you for watching.